Good morning, everyone who's gathered here and has checked in on this webcast. I want to welcome you to St. Peter's Essex Fells Morning Worship for Sunday, March 22nd, the fourth Sunday in Lent, and to prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. John Provarnik will play for us a Bach prelude so that we can spend our time opening heart, mind, and spirit to worship the living God. For where two or three are gathered together here in the church, but also here in our virtual community, the spirit of God, the glory of God is present in our midst. <laughs> find the service leaflet on the St. Peter's website, but you can also follow it in your prayer books at home. So we begin with Holy Eucharist, right two, on page 351 of the prayer book. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sin. His, His mercy and you forever. Beloved in Christ, we've come together in the presence of God to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to pray together so that we may prepare our hearts and mind to worship him. Let us kneel or stand in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may receive the assurance of forgiveness that comes from his infinite goodness and mercy. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy of us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant him us merciful Father for his sake that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us now hear the word of God.
The first lesson is written in the first book of Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehem Emily, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are, you, are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read Psalm 23 responsibly, responding at the asterisk. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in he makes me lie down in green pastures. And leaves me beside still waters. He revives my soul. And guides me along my pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they come on me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head in the world. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second lesson is written in the letter of Paul the Apostle to the Christian community of Ephesus. Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. 
Glory to you, Lord Christ. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit in there? Some were saying, it is he, and others were saying, no, it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus and made mud and spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. I said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him to the Pharisees, who had formerly, the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And he said, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and that he had received his sight until they called it the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jewish leaders had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? They reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person called person born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sin, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into the world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, 
and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to him, if you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. I came into the world so that those who do not see may see, and so that those who think they see may be blind or better yet, perhaps, remain in their blindness. Sometimes we see more than other times. Sometimes we've been blind to something, and then we begin to see it. One morning, the great New England poet E. e. Cummings got up, looked out at the fresh new day, and this poem arose in his heart, in his pen, and then on his lips, you may know it. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day for the leaping, greenly spirits and trees and a blue, true dream of sky and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I who have died am alive again today. And this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and of love, and of wings, and of the gay, great, happening, illimitably earth. How should tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, breathing, any lifted from the know of all nothing, human merely being, doubt unimaginably you? Now the ears of my ears awaken, now the eyes of my eyes are open. His ears awoke, the eyes of his eyes, the deeper seeing in us awoke. And so our gospels say, wake up, sleeper. Christ will give you light. And Jesus tells the man born blind, go and wash in the pool of Siloam and you will see. The great mystics, the people who see more than we do and therefore see more of the glory and presence of God in our lives, say that ordinary consciousness, our ordinary routine is a kind of half sleep or half awake. They go even further to say we're dead to certain things. We're not alive to them. And that something can happen to us that we become more alive the way E. Cummings was more alive that morning. I thank God for most this amazing day on days when I walk out and it's absolutely glorious. The poem is written on my heart. Our ordinary social life is a kind of agenda focused, blinder, keeping things out. I've got to do this, I've got to do that. It gets things done. It's an agenda-dominated consciousness. There's nothing wrong with it. The question is, when do we allow ourselves to awaken out of it, out of the blinders of our agenda-weary business? Or worse yet, out of any kind of hardness of heart, that means there are filters that we don't see the homeless person lying on the street, the people in trouble that we know about. There are just certain things we're not going to see. Now, I grant you, we can't bear seeing too much at a time. The great poet once said, 
humanity cannot bear too much reality. But if life does not involve a continual waking up to more and more, we are of most people most to be pitied. But waking up can be a problem. It jolts us out of our routine. And such a time as we're living now, with socially enforced seclusion, with social distancing, which we're practicing here in this taping, can become a time of isolation when we don't see anybody else. Like all those people in the supermarket who don't see anybody else who has need of goods and they're taking them all. That woman my wife saw in the King supermarket taking every single wipe she could find on the shelf was not seeing anyone else's need. It's understandable. Self-preservation, of course. Love yourself, yes. Love others as yourself. Love yourself as others. And love the God in everyone above everything else. Now the man born blind is jolted out of his accustomed way of life. He long ago acclimated to being a beggar. His family acclimated to his blindness. There was a lot of blindness in Jesus's day for many, many reasons, as there still is among us. Worse yet, this jolted the local society because Jesus is healing on the Sabbath and having the man work according to certain stringent interpretations of Jewish law, not everybody shared this opinion, because he goes and he makes a mud pack and puts it on his eyes. This also takes place, and the text does not tell us, in a time of considerable crisis, when jolts happen. There is periodic terrorist activity in the land of Israel. In the face of a slow unfolding crisis coming like a slowly building thunderstorm, the different parties, religious parties, denominations, sects of Judaism are at each other's throats. That's what's going on in this gospel between Jesus and the Pharisees. And times like this, where we're jolted out of the ordinary, as Israel was being progressively jolted out of the ordinary in its own day, are also occasions for sin. The opportunity for sin to flourish for the violating of the social and the personal good. In such times, some people see very clearly how to profit over others' vulnerabilities, how to see only themselves. But their vision is enslaved, blinded to the life-sustaining fabric of goodness, which is the social order, our families, the wider world, creation itself. Which is why Jesus says, if you were blind, you would not have sin in the sense of intentionally violating the law. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. Not because God's keeping it on you, but because you're holding it to yourself and continuing it, to practice it. When life is jolted out of this ordinary routine, however, Latent abilities with, uh, within us have a chance to wake up. There's, of course, the fight-flight mechanism, and many of you may have been experiencing this in the last couple of weeks, of rapid change and sudden new restrictions on our behavior. But fight-flight with its hyper-alertness and obsession to do something, do something, do something, and to burrow down as appropriate can also mellow into a heightened awareness of the world, of our own needs, of the needs of those closest to us, and the needs of those we are still in contact with. It can provoke a surge of compassion and helpfulness, sometimes spontaneous, that can go overboard. My wife and I are older. Our younger neighbors are keep getting in touch with us, asking us if they can go to the market for us. That's not something they ordinarily do, but crisis evokes this in people. We are a cooperative species on the one hand, 
and a self-regarding species on the other. And it's always a struggle between the two. And then there's the, the, the self and other concern. Protectiveness first, yes, of course. We cannot do good for anybody else unless we take care of ourselves. And I can witness from my own experience taking care of yourselves in a time when you may have been jolted into hyperacuity, hypertensivity, into an intensity of emotion is more important than ever before. But once the initial arousal of that passes, that wider concern can grow. And as I said in our last time of meeting together, when we weren't able to exchange the peace by shaking hands or hugging each other, let's take limitation as an opportunity. There's limitation, yes. Physical distancing, yes. But social distancing does not mean we have to stop socializing. Let's move from social distancing to physical distancing and distance socializing. If there's somebody you need to reach out to by telephone, we've got so many devices these days. You can FaceTime, you can Zoom, you can email, you can do the old-fashioned telephone, you can do all kinds of things. Um, distance socializing. The smile on the face of the grim looking person. The ability to say thank you. The checkout person at the supermarket. These are more important than ever before. So times of crisis like this provide the opportunity for the deeper Christ capacity in us to grow and flow through our actions. If we listen, look, and learn. Listen to your fears, talk to them, calm them, and let them inspire you to a wisdom of how to deal with them. Look more clearly at others with fresh eyes, as creatures of God, as vulnerable as you are. Times like this make us feel our common vulnerability, that we really are all in this together. And in a culture which has developed a kind of rampant individualism, this can remind us of the reality, the social reality that sustains us all. We are all in this together and must help each other. Your physical distancing is loving your neighbor. Your neighbor's outreach to you is loving you. The Collect recalls Jesus' feeding of the 5,000. In a time of turmoil and danger, he feeds body and soul with living bread. As we practice social distancing and distant socializing, let us remember that others are risking their lives to feed us and other people with life and health and food. That's because there are so many who are not blinded, but see the need. And we can be among them in the very smallest ways, or even bigger. Amen. And now we will hear a solo of the familiar American hymn, Amazing Grace. <clears throat>
And now I invite you at home to stand as you are able, as we are doing here in the choir of the church, and recite the baptismal creed of the ancient church, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered in the conscious fire, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to death. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. And the life of In the midst of this time of crisis, let us pray for all creation, for all humankind made in the image of God. In your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayer. For the Holy Catholic Church throughout the world, that we may walk the way of Christ with renewed intention, deepening the life of Christ within us. In your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayer. For our bishop, for priests and deacons and all who minister in Christ, and for all the holy people of God, that the mission of Christ may go forward among us in new ways. In your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayer. For all the peoples of the earth who live in this miracle of intertwined life and that we may delivered from flood, famine, and the heedless destruction of God's creation. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For our families, friends, companions, neighbors, and for all those we love, especially those celebrating birthdays, Marianne White, Patty Vitiello, and Tony Ferroni. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. For the hungry and homeless, for the sick and the suffering, especially Lori Alcott, Kay Bischoff, Grace Bishop, Nancy Bavona, William Bogier, Bonnell family, Mary Budd, Roger Carr, Laura Copeland, Adele Cochran, and Kyle Perkins. In your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayer. For all those disadvantaged and disempowered, suddenly without employment, sheltering in place, risking themselves in service to others, living in isolation, that they may find the embrace of God's love in their hearts and in the kind actions of others. In your mercy, Lord, Hear our prayer. Prayer. for all who are tempted, oppressed, afflicted, or lost in the darkness of any kind, in your mercy, Lord, Hear Hear our prayer. Prayer. For those who rest in Christ and for all the departed, 
that they may go from strength to strength in the life of perfect service. In your mercy, Lord. Hear our God, you have bound us together in a common life. Help us in the midst of times of crisis to be ever mindful of the common good and to work together with mutual forbearance and respect. We may find our way through this current crisis with grace toward us, confidence in your love, and trust that in all circumstances, you are working with us for the best outcomes. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. During this time, you will be receiving two e-blasts um, a week. Uh, to keep you informed, and the website will be carrying up-to-date information. As you know, not only the Episcopal Church, but the Archdiocese has suspended weekend services, as well as the, the congregations of other denominations. Um, we will not be having a, a service here in the church on March 29th, but I'm happy to tell you that we will hear on March 27th whether we have approval to go together, to go uh, forward with Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and Easter services. We all devoutly hope that that is the case. A task force has been appointed, a joint task force between the Episcopal Diocese of New Jersey and the Episcopal Diocese of Newark, consulting with the epidemiologists, with the state, with the Center, uh, Centers for Disease Control, and with the national government to determine the wisest course of action. We will let you know um, as soon as possible when we hear one way or another on March 27th. But one way or another, Easter will come. One way or another, Palm Sunday will come. And so we'll keep you, uh, we'll keep you uh, informed of how we can all be engaged in that and not let our corporate worship of God, even though it is distant socializing and distant gathering, elapse during this period. The vestry, I know, is also consulting. Um, uh, at a meeting tomorrow about uh, how we can um, continue our corporate socializing and contact. And I'm going to ask our warden, Frank Butterfield, to say a few words for you. Thank you, Father Bob. Um, obviously, the vestry would like to thank Father Bob and uh, the staff uh, for their work this week in trying to, you know, modify the normal operations of, the, of our parish um, to reach out to all those um, that are um, feeling, obviously, the, the changes that we have undergone. Uh, we, we, we had a meeting last, uh, our normally scheduled meeting last Sunday, and um, we decided, obviously, it was pertinent to have an additional meeting by telephone uh, tomorrow on Saturday, uh, where we will hope to um, address any uh, further needs uh, that the staff uh, may be feeling. Also, we will be helping to reach out to members of the parish just to see how everyone's doing. Um, if anyone is in need of some um, service, uh, we want to make sure that they feel who, that they know who to reach out to, to reach out to Father Bob. Um, we will be there to help and assist to help those that may need groceries or that may need um, some other type of service, uh, but you have to reach out, you have to respond to us so that we know what we can do. But um, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Father Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And thanks to all our staff who are continuing working. As I've said in communications to you, St. Peter's may not be meeting physically, but we're not, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not out of business. <laughs> business is continuing. So in lieu of an offering, I do remind you that you can make your weekly or monthly uh, offerings uh, as part of your pledge or to make a special donation to the church on the church website. And that will be coming back to you next Sunday. Meanwhile, whether you're sitting or standing, Let's do as we would be doing here in the worship space if we were all together. And have a moment of silence to think of the people 
that we know both in the church and out of the church, and to wish them peace, goodwill, health, and blessing. Let us pray, O God, who has taught us that in quietness and confidence shall be our strength. Let the peace of Christ reign in our hearts and shed abroad through us as a blessing for all who cross our path. Amen. After the final prayer, I invite you to listen to the postlude as a way of moving from the holiness of this service back into the ordinary world. After the dismissal, John will play for us a piece of music to nourish mind and soul. Let us pray. Watch over your people, Lord, as they walk the pathway of Lent, that in deepened prayer and devotion to your commandments, they may grow in renewed love for you others, themselves, and all creation. Through Jesus Christ, great shepherd of the sheep and Lord of all creation. Amen. Amen. Go forth in peace, walking in the way of Christ. Thanks be to God. <laughs>